Hello and welcome to Off the Books, where we surf the uncharted waters of accounting, finance, risk, and wherever else the waves take us. This episode is brought to you by Workiva, the one platform that brings together financial reporting, ESG, audit, and risk teams, and brings you that happy hour vibe, whatever time it is. My name is Mike Gravano, Off the Books producer, recovering cherry coke addict, and today's host. I'm looking forward to debuting a great conversation today, and I'm very glad to have you hanging 10 with us. With me, as always, are your OTB hosts, Catherine Sai, professional asker of questions and lover of venti so chais, and Steve Soder, accountant, Diet Coke aficionado. Today is a very special episode. Yes, as it is. Our YouTube viewers can see. Uh, Catherine, explain what's going on. We are coming to you from Amplify Americas in Nashville. We've got about 2,000 finance, accounting, risk, audit, ESG people all in one room. Yes. It's pretty exciting. Amazing. And uh, Steve, for the uninitiated, why? what makes Amplify special? Amplify is special because it gathers those people together. Sometimes when you're in financial reporting, for example, or maybe sustainability or probably an especially audit, sometimes you can feel a little bit like an outsider, like you're the only one that knows what that job is like. You're the only one that knows what the day-to-day is, what the challenges, the things that you wrestle with. This is a place where all of those people come together, and not do they only come together with the people who do their same job, but now they come together with people from other teams. So they can be having the conversations about the challenges that they're having, the successes and the wins, the things that they're focused on. There is such a vibe and an energy when you're at Amplify. I've been coming to Workiva Amplify for a long, long time, and this one is over the top. That's right. I think uh, they said today we are 12 Amplifies in, and this feels like the biggest. I only have a few under my belt, but this feels like the biggest one we've done. It's the uh, first one we've had the Sports Center style. Oh, heck yeah. Off the books, which means it's the most important. Uh, <laughs> well, I, I can tell you by numbers, it, it, it absolutely is the biggest. We broke uh, all previous registration goals that we had for in-person attendance. So this right one is on. officially the biggest. That's sick. Catherine, what is, uh, we, a year ago, we had Dr. Robert Copley come on and tell us conference survival tips. What, what is one you've learned on the mean streets of Amplify? Well, I know that I was supposed to come into this with a plan for what I want to get out of the conference. You're right. And so there are definite people that I want to talk to and run into. So I'm trying to get in front of them yeah. at opportune times. How nice. about you, Steve? Uh, I hate to say this. Meanwhile, I'm trying to get from like one commitment to the next, like through <laughs> back alleys and hallways. Because Well, because once you find somebody, you talk to them, you want to keep talking to them. Yes. Yes. People that you haven't seen for a long time. People are struggling with interesting things, like right. have great things to talk about. It's actually a little bit of a challenge, and I've been late a few times, including to this recording. <laughs> and that's, you know what? That's just part of doing it live. That's right. You're going to be late sometimes. So it's, yeah, how to extricate yourself from those fun conversations and be like, we should pick this back up later. And I mean it. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so I, I think it'll be a lot of fun, Stevie. You said how, well, what a, what a whirlwind, uh, hodgepodge group of people we have going on here. I think we should start grabbing people from the crowd and see if we can learn a little bit about them and what they have going on and maybe what they're looking forward to or concerned about in 2024. 100%. Let's do it. All right. Let's go. Thank you for joining us. And can you give the audience uh, your name and role? Sure. Hi, I'm Rachel Stab. I am the ESG reporting manager at the Hershey Company. Excellent. And uh, you're familiar, I, I've heard, with my compatriots. Oh, yes. Uh, I know Steve and Catherine well. <laughs> Excellent. And for good reason. Rachel's a rock star. Explain, explain what that means, Steve. Well, I think Rachel's been at the forefront of this intersection of financial reporting, ESG, all subject to assurance. The Hershey Company has been no stranger to that. They've been doing it for a very long time. And uh, Rachel, you got Influencer of the Year, right? Woo-hoo. I don't want to cut off the questions. Yes. Can, you, can you tell us a little bit about that? I heard about that today. Oh, well, thank you, Steve. Uh, yes, I'm very honored that Workiva selected me for one of their customer awards. Uh, yes, ESG Influencer of the Year. Um, I, you know, we have, thank you, thank you. <laughs> we have worked a lot to really enhance what we do at the Hershey Company to make sure that we are integrated and collaborative across our teams. Um, and are really pushing the envelope and the capability is a Workiva. And one of the pieces that I really like about our partnership is how much Workiva really instills and takes to heart the feedback that we give in order to evolve and mature the program for the benefit of all. Sounds like you're not afraid to use technology in your job at all. Uh, I try not to be afraid, but you know what? There's a lot of things I don't know, so you don't know what you don't know. Yeah, yeah. Do you have any words of wisdom for people out there who are maybe just starting to use technology to do ESG reporting? What should they look for? Um, I would say don't be afraid to just rip off the Band-Aid. I mean, you have to try what you have to try, and at the same time, 
you have to find out what's best fit for your company and where you're headed strategically, what's material to your business, and also manage that appetite for change. I think that's a big thing that we deal with a lot at Hershey is how much change can our company and our peers embrace and adopt and how fast are we willing to push to make new things happen. Do you think that today that kind of fail fast mentality like like is acceptable? Like everybody gets that this is relatively new. People are going to make mistakes where maybe five or especially like 10 years from now, you probably won't have that luxury if maybe you're a little bit behind the curve. I mean, nobody wants to fail. I get that. But I'm just curious if, if there's maybe a little more grace today than we expect there to be in the future. I, I mean, I definitely hope so. I think what I keep constantly remind our leadership team about is that finance, right? I'm not a finance expert, but finance had several decades to get up to speed, compliant with SOCs and all sure. of the different controls in the finance world. And ESG has had like three. Like yeah. we are literally pivoting and adjusting and trying to adapt to change as fast as absolutely possible. But there's only so much as humans we can absorb. And so it's finding that balance across those. And I agree. I think the, the fail fast is important. I think it's really important to be clear with our stakeholders about what's working, what's not working, and how we're going to pivot and adapt to change in the future to try to make an impact. Thinking about adapting to change in the future, uh, what are your thoughts about AI and its capabilities and, and if your organization could use it to boost productivity? You know, I think there's a lot of potential for it, especially as I want to get started. If our manager says, hey, let's let's draft a section on stakeholder engagement or value chain mapping, I would say, I probably haven't done that yet. So let's let's figure out the best way to do it and to leverage some of the AI capabilities to get us started to then overlay the Hershey tone and our particular language and narrative in the way that we want to tell our story that's synergistic to the holistic company view. I think that will be really beneficial as we get going and as we build a team that is less mature in ESG experience and more mature in Hershey company acumen. Well, and, and it feels like that actually somewhat supports the fail fast is in the way that like it's a little bit risk free as in, hey, let's see what it does. If it gives us something great and useful, fantastic, we're going to run with it. If it doesn't, that's OK. We're not any worse off than we were before. Totally agree. I love the fact you can just like delete it out if, if you don't agree with it or aren't sure of the sources or just yeah. aren't super on board. And they're like, oh, OK, that worked, but it wasn't really what I was looking for. Yep. Great. Delete. Let's try again. Yep. Sounds like about every off the book script that we've ever put together. <laughs> Don't reveal our secrets, Steve. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> well, how do you build a career in ESG? What was your path like? Oh my gosh, this question is very loaded for me. <laughs> I, uh, I am not an ESG. I guess I guess I'm a professional now, but I definitely an wasn't an influencer. And, oh yes, as my husband likes to tell me now, <laughs> you're an influencer. Um, my career has been very ping ponged, and I think that, that actually sets me up for better success in my job. So I actually have a. Not to go into all the deals, but background in law enforcement and have court test oh. room uh, testifying training and then was in several other fields in ESG, particularly in retail and finance and now in CPG with Hershey. And honestly, I talk all the time about how I take my experience. We did a translate technical, scientific courtroom, you know, forensic science, criminal justice stuff and translate it for a judge or jury. And I'm doing the same thing now, but with climate change data, with waste, with child labor in our human rights and our supply chain and just translating it so that our investor audiences and our stakeholders can better understand the impact Hershey is having and the work that we're doing. That actually makes a lot of sense to me because with courtroom testimony, you have to be able to stand behind what you're saying. Absolutely. Sure. And same with ESG. That's awesome. Rachel, thank you for joining us. We have a closing question of the day, as we always do, at Off the Books. You look scared. <laughs> Don't think it's, it's going to be okay. What is it going to be Because we're... we're <laughs> Reporting live from Amplify, what is uh, a conference survival tip that you've either heard or gained or wish you knew in years past? Oh, yeah. Um, to say pause, let all the emails pile up. I know we're all thinking right now about what's happening behind the scenes, but just soak it all in, network, and enjoy the experiences. There's so much to learn from each other. I love that. Awesome. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Rachel. Uh, let's kick it off. Uh, start with you. Uh, name and title, please. My name is Maria Seglin, and I'm Director of Internal Audit at Ascent, okay. Mortgage Insurance. And you? Tiffany Leva, Director of Internal Audit, also Mortgage Insurance. We work together. <laughs> okay. Yes. I love it. Co-directors. I was going to ask if you were in separate companies, if you're like mortal enemies or mortal frenemies. <laughs> no. <But>. No. <laughs> we're a team. Yep. Excellent. In like your work life and on the podcast right now. This is perfect. Yes. Exactly. Well, yeah. What is it? How do you work together as directors of internal audit? Is it, is it divide and conquer or? 
It's a lot of collaboration. It is. We, we do divide and conquer, um, but we also just work together kind of seamlessly. If we're gonna keep this on like Workiva theme, <laughs> we crush Workiva basically. So yes, thank you. Yeah. Now, what have you heard so far at the conference or expect to hear at the conference over the next couple of days that excites you or that you're interested in or that you're dying to hear? I'm really excited about the smart links that I heard about today. Right? I think it's going to be so helpful for us to be able to share across workspaces. Yeah. Sharing That's across workspaces key. is huge. It is. We've kind of been asking for that for a while, so excited to hear that that's finally happening. Spoiler alert, you're not the only one. Then so <laughs> we've done it. So this is great. It's terrific. <laughs> what, wait, thinking about the future in 2024, what are you? What concerns you most for your role for about next year? What's worrying you, keeping you up at night? You know, honestly, trying to keep up with the technology, everything that was kind of you know, shown to us today with the generative AI and how we can incorporate that into our world. Yeah. Not sure how to do that yet. And hopefully Workiva will be the answer for us and help us, you know, guide us there. Now, are y'all freaking out about ESG, like from an internal audit standpoint, <laughs> or is the freak out train not quite left the station? It's kind of what we don't know right now. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. It's the land of the abyss for us. Okay. The well, steamboat has some steam, but it hasn't <laughs> like gone anywhere. I love all these fixing metaphors. That's right. Perfect. <laughs> well, you're not the only ones, that's for sure. <laughs> and, and, and thinking just because you said that the college, uh, how would you describe me? So I'm I'm a poet by trade, right? I, and I'm working at this tech company. I'm a little out of my element, apparently. Explain your job to a five-year-old. How would you do that? We have to go in and figure out what others do and learn that within one or two weeks and be able to document that and then take it back and give them recommendations on how to make it better. <laughs> I think that's great. That's I great. tell them, I actually told my five-year-old this. Uh, <laughs> I just said, Mommy makes people follow the rules. <laughs> and to do that, I draw these pictures over here to our flow charts. And then I get to tell them what to do over here. And then I ask them for stuff here. And then yeah, I have to write a report about it. He was like, oh. And lots of coloring. We love coloring. Yeah. Yeah. Of course. Yeah, after you said mommy makes people follow the rules, it was like, tell me about it. Yeah. <laughs> it was I like, I know. I thought you were going to say mommy makes people get in trouble and maybe get fired. <laughs> no, just, just no more nice auditors. <laughs> well, thank goodness. As a, as a former accountant, I really appreciate nice auditors. Yeah, it should be teamwork if it's flowing right. No, I think it is. And, and to be honest with you, I find that the best accountants, the best financial reporting team lean into internal audit, right? Hey, I... You yeah. need that team to That's help right. you stay ahead of issues because nobody wants to have an error. Nobody wants a restatement, right? Nobody exactly. wants that stuff. Yeah, that's right. They come to us for a lot. They do. We have a good working relationship with everybody in our company, I think. So they come to us as a resource. Yeah. They come to us as just a good knowledge source of like, hey, what do I do? And that's we're awesome. able to help. So, Great. yeah. And we are here with someone who is a former guest on Off the Books. Jonathan Gregory. Jonathan, why don't you introduce yourself to our listeners? Yeah, Catherine, thanks for having me. Jonathan Gregory. I am the North America controller at the Hershey Company. That must be a sweet place to work. Very sweet. Bum, bum, bum. Bum. There it is. <laughs> and it, Steve will go off on his love for Reese. You know what? What's there not to love? The sticks, it's a Kit Kat, it's peanut butter, it's chocolate all smashed together. It's the greatest invention since Milton Hershey himself invented or perfected mass production. I mean, you are a walking encyclopedia when it comes to the Hershey Company. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. I've been there a couple of times. Spent a it's lot amazing. Of time there. <laughs> so, Jonathan, I want to talk about you a little okay. bit. All right. I know you are a controller now. Mm -hmm. How is that different from previous roles that you've had at Hershey? Yeah, great question. So, when I was at, I've been at Hershey for almost eight years now. Prior to my most current role, I was in external reporting, technical accounting. I was either part of or leading that particular team. But in my new role, I get a little more granular. I focus on the North America aspect of the business on our confectionery side. So it's really the US, it's Canada. Um, and I still do some things in the area of mergers and acquisitions and ESG readiness. Sounds exciting. It's, it's, a, it's a handful. What, what about that, if you could share, what about your job stresses you out the most? Ooh. That is a great question. We'll keep um, out any names if you need to throw some people out of the bus. Yeah, no, we're not throwing people under the <laughs> bus, but certainly uh, a lot of the different things coming down the pike. I mean, you know, ESG readiness is 
pretty far and wide reaching. So we have things in the US, we have things in the European Union. That stresses me out. But also at the end of the day, uh, my oversight over the North America controllership team is like 80% of the business. So while we have salty snacks and we have an international side, uh, North America is by far the largest. I feel like your name's kind of on the line a little bit, right? In a sense. I mean, I report up to the people whose names are on the line, not necessarily me, but I guess me. So you they've got a, the shadows. Yeah, they, they, they've got a throat to choke, basically. Is yeah, that one? Yeah, exactly. But let's not... Uh, I'm not trying to get to there yet. <laughs> well, what advice do you have for when you have to talk to some of those big name people in your company? Stay calm. Do your homework. Uh, go in with an agenda. That's what I like to do. So if I know that I have a meeting with our CFO or if I have a meeting with our CAO or anybody else really across the company, you know, I like to set the agenda and have the talking points ready. So basically the opposite of our experience of bringing you on to Off the Books right now. Is that correct? Yeah, zero <laughs> questions ahead of time. Everything's on the fly. <laughs> with, with, with given everything you just said, what are you looking forward to most in 2024? What do you want to invest in or hoping your org is going to invest in? Um, M&A is always exciting. We're always looking at new things. I mean, nothing concrete, but... That's always fun. That's a fun area of accounting. Yeah. Yes, Catherine, things can be fun. <laughs> oh, that's uh, right. That's right. What makes it fun? I mean, every deal is different. And that's either a good or a bad thing is how you approach it. Um, so a lot of the M&A activity that we've done historically has been more uh, salty snacks, popcorn, pretzels. Those have been recent years things. But even though they're salty, I've still been a part of them. And uh, I'm excited for just what where the business is going to grow next year and uh, continuing to oversee the largest area of the company. Don't screw it up. <laughs> Steve, for the 50th time, I'm like trying not to. I'm trying my hardest. You're doing a great job. I have a dumb question. No question is dumb. Have you, you work at Hershey, Hershey Park is awesome. Uh, I grew up in Pennsylvania, so I've spent some time there. Uh, have you done like, there's wine and cheese pairings, then there's new, there's like beer and donut pairings. Have you done what Hershey ride to what Hershey treat Ooh. and gathered around what pairs best? Solid question. <laughs> so just to make sure I understand the question. Sure. So with the rides at Hershey Park, if they were equated to... Or Hers what, what, what is the best treat to ride right before you ride the roller coaster or afterwards? Oh, I would say none are before. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I'm just like a good old classic Hershey bar. Okay. Um, you know, we have Hershey Chocolate World, so you get a free ride. You get the tour of how they make all this stuff. And then at the end of the ride, you get a free chocolate bar, like a little mini. Um, but at Hershey Park, yeah, a lot of our rides are also themed. So we have, right. like, one of our newer roller coasters is Candemonium. So it has, like, Hershey, Reese, and maybe Twizzler as, like, the theme characters of, uh, of that roller coaster. Steve's dying to go on it. I, I tried. I did. Last time I was that there, is true. I tried. That is true. We need to do an off-the-books field trip. You yes. know what? We do. You should do it, like, literally right in the middle of, like, Hershey Park. Yeah. Grab grab random goer buys. Be like, eat this. It rhymes. Then get on the ride. How it cares. It'll, it'll turn into a market research activity. Exactly. Yeah, there it is. That park has got to be, like, a great recruitment tool for Hershey. Well, well, maybe I should, like, set the record straight. I'm talking a lot about Hershey Park. The Hershey Company is actually separate from Hershey Entertainment and Resorts. Okay. The way our company is structured, yes, we're a publicly traded company, but our largest shareholder is the Hershey Trust Company, which was founded by Milton Hershey. Uh, I don't. I should probably know these things. I don't know when it was founded, but it's essentially where he left all of his money. It's one of gotcha. the largest trust companies in the state of Pennsylvania. So we're actually uh, totally separate from Hershey Entertainment and Resorts that supports the park and a lot of the hotels and attractions in the in the Hershey area. But still, we're obviously doing a lot of branding with them. So, yes. yeah. So it's okay. Jonathan, thank you so much for spending some time with us. We're so lucky to have you. Yeah, it was great to be here. And thanks for not providing the questions ahead of time. <laughs> you did a great job. All right, well, thank you. Once I hit my late 30s, I knew I had a serious decision to make. I could either get weirdly into World War II history, learn an absurd amount about wine, or start collecting vinyl records. Since I was never one for memorizing facts, and I think wine is best paired with, well, more wine, I started collecting albums. And yes, dear listener, the feel of a tactile piece of music is great in your hands. And yes, the sound really is warmer with all the pops and crackles underneath as Fiona Apple or Tom Petty warble through my apartment. 
But record collecting is complicated. First, there's choosing a categorization method. Do you go straight alphabetical or split by genre or year? And what if people you live with don't care about any system and like a monster, they put Orville Peck's pony right next to a Tribe Called Quest's low-end theory? Then there's tracking album prices. They can fluctuate more than the stock market. You have to know where and when to buy that Carly Rae Jepsen you've been coveting. I wish there was a Rekiva for vinyl, a unified platform to put all that vital financial reporting, ESG, and audit and risk info in one spot and know what the most up-to-date facts and figures are. Dashboards to help you understand where your albums are by genre and year, and linked numbers and narrative to track a musician's career as they hop through various bands. Wouldn't that be great? Doesn't that sound lovely? Thanks for joining us on the podcast. Why don't you introduce yourself to our listeners? Hi, my name is uh, Dr. Jeffrey Pullman. I'm an adjunct professor for a couple of local colleges in the Washington, D.C. area. And I'm an associate director of financial systems for Department of Justice, and we were a Cuba customer. So as you've heard the discussions here at the sessions, what's been top of mind for you? What's resonated for you as well? I'm looking forward to the generative AI I saw. That's kind of pretty uh, interesting tool for us. I mean, I think, you know, for, from, a, from a governance perspective or government perspective is, you know, having tools to kind of predict what's going to happen from an audit perspective. So that's something definitely we're interested in. I think other people should be interested in is like, if you can get one step ahead of your external auditors, that's better and so forth versus the auditors coming back and telling you, oh, by the way, you have A, B, X, Y, and Z. If I knew I had A, B, X, Y before the auditors get it, I can get those fixed and don't have to deal with Z. So, yeah. so I'm looking forward to see how the generative AI gets embedded into the platform. If you don't mind me asking, does generative AI pose an even more complex or difficult governance question for the federal government because it is the federal government? Well, I mean, I think the, the key thing is I share the data. I mean, we, yeah, I don't want, we don't want to share it with somebody else and so forth. So if we can do predictive analysis on our own data while sharing it to other places, that's great. I mean, the whole the, the whole viewpoint, if you look at beyond the government side, if you look at AI, it's like, yeah, I'm going to use AI tools to do predictive analysis and so forth. But the challenge is, I'm, you know, my data is now intertwined with other sets of data. Right, the, sure. The government doesn't want, I mean, even within the federal side, branch A doesn't want to share branch, doesn't want to share the data with branch B. And then when you have large departments, you know, a subcomponent didn't want to share the data with another subcomponent. So trying to take advantage of that, that data with MI component, that makes it a lot easier and so forth. So that's kind of, the interesting point from a, a kind of degenerative AI. Um, and then I said, we're looking at it from an academic viewpoint of, you know, using the tools and so forth. But I think one of the problems is, is that people are looking, well, I'll just use AI to do my work and you don't have to worry about nothing and so forth. But, you know, as we know, AI is a learning process. So, and yeah, bad news, garbage in, garbage out. So <laughs> right. if you have garbage data in, it's going to give you garbage prediction and so forth. But you still have to do work with in regarding to what the AI tool tells you and so forth. It's just, it doesn't do all your homework and so forth. And I think that's on the, Academic side, that's kind of the weird thing of, you know, and I'm, I'm now forgetting people to think about things and so forth. When we did a session. You had the same questions, Steve. <laughs> I know. Yeah, it, we, we had a, I had a session with a school I uh, teach as an adjunct, and I said, you know, you know, you still need to do, you still you still need the analysis skills, the writing skills, the communication skills. The, 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 the tool is going to give you something back. You got to determine what is it valid and so forth and do additional thinking. You just can't sit back and say, you know, throw a question to the tool and it gives you answers. Like, okay, I'm taking the answer and call it a day. There was a, um, there was a Harvard Business Review. I, I can't remember the article, but someone actually, uh, for his class, he gave, uh, basically, gave all the lecture notes to the to the AI tool, and basically gave the AI tool a final exam. So, interesting enough, everybody thought that the AI tool would get an A. No, the AI tool got a C. So he actually basically was average and so forth. So. It's interesting is how the AI is going to evolve, you know, on the, on the business side, the government side, and in our personal lives. As someone who uses technology and help bring it to your agency, I'm wondering what sort of advice you have for peers in the public sector who are trying to bring technology on. How do you make the business case for that? Well, I can tell you the first thing you need to do, government and non-government, you, you need to get your security IT people involved. They're going to the ones who want to make sure that what you deploy makes sense from a security perspective. It's going to be the key thing is protecting your data. Data are you know, the, the, two most, the two most viable assets are human and data. So you got to protect that, that non-human asset, which is data. So you got to get the security people involved, make sure that they understand what the technology is, what the, the loopholes are, so they can, you know, put controls around the place so that they protect the, you know, the agency or the, the firm viewpoint. And once you get the technology, the CIOs involved and so forth, then it makes it easier to adapt. But if you don't get them involved, you know, when you think you have a path for it, they will shut the door and say, we can't do this and so forth. So I think the key thing is, is you know, and I've said this before, there's a partnership between the CFO office and the CIO office. Sure. 
It's that Unite to Ignite theme again. Unite Coming to Ignite. Together. Yeah, you have to. I mean, you, you have to. Right. You can't, you know, it's like, it's like, the, the, what is it? Um, and I'm a NASA nerd. It's like I said, no bucks, no buck Roger. So the CFO mm-hmm. shop is going to provide the, 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 the financing, the money for the technologies and so forth. The, you know, the technology people will provide you the technology advances and so forth. So it has to be a partnership. It just can't be one side of that. One side completely has complete control of the decision and so forth. Otherwise, you get what you, you'll get what you pay for. Sure. Well, and perhaps no more important with Gen AI because of how fast it's moving, you, it, that could get out of hand in a hurry. Yes. And, and I think the key thing is finding those appropriate, you know, use the word you afraid use case for those types of technologies and so forth because it's not used, it's not to be useful for every case and so forth, but you, you got to take your time and so forth and then, um, and then figure out the, the right way to deploy and uh, the right way to use it. How about a closing question of the day? Are you ready for this? Sure. Okay, we're, we've been asking people what their tips are for getting the most out of conferences like this. I think one is, you know, get the app, plan which ones you want to go, and then go, and like says, um, here, yeah, I'm in here for like a day and a half more for, you know, networking and so forth. So I've, I've done a lot of conferences. I do like three or four a year. And what I do is I get the app, and I try to figure out targeting which ones I want to go. And then if I, I figure all the ones I want to go. And then when there are conflicts, I figure this is my primary one, this is my secondary one. And, and it always works out. So I think you should just plan plan your plan your stay here and so forth and and definitely try to network with people and so forth this is probably the best layout i have regarding to uh yes. so i'll give it to the hand to amanda and the marketing people i mean i i'm I already wrote a note to i'm on a um committee that does some stuff for uh uh aga and say hey when we come to the actual you know besides wearing your walking shoes because there's a lot of, a lot of your walking <laughs> yeah. make sure to basically look at the the layout of the room and so forth and i think that works out for having people be able to go and see all the booths and so forth. When they kind of cramp together, you're going to say, well, I'm not going to go here, but then you're going to miss out by, um, um, you may miss out on something. Like I so said, when I came yesterday, we, I saw the Genetra AI. It's like, oh, okay, this is kind of neat. Yes. And so forth, nobody's there. And I got a personal one-on-one demo. I took a picture of some screens, sent some things back to some uh, colleagues. We want to say, we should talk about this when we get back and so forth. But you no, know, the layout the layout is, is, is perfect. I mean, this is a perfect uh, layout and so forth. So. Good to hear. Thank no so kidding. Much, yeah. Thank you. So, and, and let me just say, Dr. Pullen, you and I would get along just fine. I'm a planner too for conferences. <laughs> Very sound advice. Welcome. Why don't you introduce yourself to our listeners? Hi, my name is Anna Sheik. I'm a senior ESG reporting analyst at the Hershey Company, and I'm really happy to be here. Thanks. Nice. We had Rachel uh, here as well, and she was sharing some insights about uh, things that she has been looking forward to at the conference, things that she has heard What have you been looking forward to and and what have you heard so far? I was really looking forward to Reese Witherspoon this morning. Right. Um, They were lined up out the door, I heard, right? Yeah. yeah. At 5.30 a.m., I heard. Yeah, she was was saying like 4 a.m. people were lining up and that's wild. But um, yeah, I was really glad to hear her advice, um, which was just be kind to everybody that you meet. Yeah. Um, Yeah. We talk a lot about how financial reporting and ESG teams are really having to come and work together. I know for sure that has been the case at the Hershey Company. I have talked to many members of your team. Are you feeling that? Are you feeling maybe more connected with kind of the day-to-day work that you're doing as well as what the financial reporting team's doing? Yeah, definitely, especially because I work remotely um, mm. and I hadn't gotten a chance to meet everybody face-to-face. So it's been great to be able to spend time with them Um, meet them in person and get to learn more about where Cuba together. How did you get into ESG? Um, So I actually have been at Hershey for about four years. Um, My background's in science, and then I decided to do business and uh, shifted to an MBA. And through that program, I started learning more about sustainability and business. um, And uh, that kind of triggered my interest. And then I was able to join the team in February of this year. Nice. And how's it gone so far? I swear we won't tell anybody. (laughs) Uh, It's going really great. I'm learning a lot. Um, I was able to be part of um, most of the process for uh, this year's report that was published, but I'm getting started now on next year's report that will be published with uh, getting everything rolled over in Workiva and working with all the different teams. So I'm really excited for that. Awesome. Thinking about next year in 2024, and I know you're you're fairly new to the role, but what's kind of keeping you up at night? What's worrying you for the future? Hmm. I would say um, a lot of the different Raider rankers um, and their change in methodologies and especially all the changes that have been implemented in Europe that are coming over and just making sure that we're able to stay up to date with all the new uh, methodologies and regulations with that. So I would say mostly um, just making sure that, that we keep up with that. Definitely. 
And speaking of next year, you mind if we ask you a closing question? Sure, go ahead. So um, we hope to have you back next year. Based on what you've experienced so far this year, what are you already looking forward to or what we've already tried to accomplish as you think about Amplify 2024 in Denver? Denver, which is where I'm from. Currently. Oh my goodness! Oh, hey, Look at I that. I live in Denver. <laughs> Cats too. lives in Denver. Oh, oh amazing. Yeah, we have to connect. Yeah, I'll oh. actually be moving to Phoenix next year, but I'll be glad to come <laughs> okay. back to Denver well, it's for a the short conference. Flight. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm looking forward to uh, what Workiva will have in terms of uh, in design with Workiva. Oh yeah. Um, because if we are able to get a lot of the key features that we use in InDesign in Workiva and have just like one stop shop with Workiva, that would be amazing for her for writing the ESG report. Awesome. You all have a beautiful report too. Yeah, definitely, yeah. <laughs> definitely. All right, Anna, thank you so much for yeah. joining thank us. Thank you for joining us. Me. Yeah, we appreciate it. Thanks. Big thanks to Rachel Staub, Maria Singlin, Tiffany Leva, Jonathan Gregory, Dr. Jeffrey Pollen, and Anna Sheik, and everyone else who came out to Amplify. And thank you, dear listener, for surfing along with us. I'm Catherine Sy, that was Steve Soder, and this has been Off the Books presented by Workiva. Please subscribe, leave a review, and tell your buddies if you liked the show. If you're watching this on YouTube, leave us a note in the comments or feel free to drop us a line at offthebooks at workiva.com. Surf's up and we'll see you on the next wave.